Yeah. Thanks, Sean. Uh, you never know what's going to happen with Sean. <laughs> I didn't plan to come up with sore quads, but here we are. Sore quads or not, cold room or not. Uh, good morning. Yeah, we're glad you are here. My name is Jeff. Like Sean said, uh, I usually do the music stuff, but once in a while, I find myself up here. And I'm glad to be here, uh, and I'm glad you're here as well. I believe God's going to do something in and through and among us today. Um, this week, though, the honest truth is that I'm just a little run down emotionally and physically as a result of just a big couple of weeks of life in ministry, but uh, I believe God's going to carry me through, and I believe no matter how you came into this space, He's going to carry you through as well. And uh, I had this great conversation in the lobby last Sunday with a guy named Richard from our church. And we were just swapping weeks. It was like, how's it going? How was this past week? And uh, we, what he ended up being able to encourage me was, uh, man, whether a week is what I plan it to be or hope it to be, whether it's filled with joys or sorrows, ease or, or difficulty, great success or wild failure, <laughs> it's always an opportunity to grow in our relationship with the Lord. Isn't that true? And that's the same for you too. So no matter what's going on outside those doors, no matter what awaits for you after these next few moments we're together, there are opportunities right now to grow in our relationship with Jesus. And uh, that's what kind of what we're aiming, what we always aim for. Uh, but last Sunday, <clears throat> we kicked off this new series, Living on Mission, this guy right here. And uh, Bruce kind of kicked the series off with this quote that, that Jesus says to a guy named Zacchaeus at this dinner party that Jesus invites himself over for. He's like, yo, Zacchaeus, come down. And uh, during dinner, he shares with Zacchaeus, and we read on this side of history, in the word that, that in John uh, cha or Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it says, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Like, that's the mission that Christ was on in his 33 years on this earth. That's the mission that he and the other two persons of the Godhead, the Father and Holy Spirit, are still on today, and that's the one that you and I are called to embrace, the mission of God. You know, this concept is uh, sometimes called the missio dei, which just means the, the sending of God or the mission of of God. And what it means, super simply, is just that God is on this great mission to, to restore humanity back to himself. That once was the case in the Garden of Eden, relationship, walking and, and being with God in that kind of relationship. But God's on this mission to restore that, in part right now and fully someday. And he sent Jesus to call us to the same mission, you and I. 2,000 years ago, he sent Jesus to take part in that mission with him. So we're commissioned to be on this co-mission, if you will, with God, to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to a sin-sick world that is lost and dying without him. And hopefully, like Jesus, we looked at Jesus' example last week. Remember that? Like what, what he was. He was the same but different, and he, he had this knack for seeing people. So as we're hopefully like Jesus, starting to see people and, and seek them out, to run after them, not to, not to say and show them how bad they've been, but to invite them to see Christ and allow him to save them, man, stuff starts to happening. And uh, in John chapter 3, we know John 3.16 usually, for God came to, you know, whatever, right? But John 3.17, I actually know it, I'm just, whatever. But John 3.17 uh, is lesser known, but just as important, I would say. For God did not send his son into the world to, you know this, condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Consistent with this seek and save the lost that we read about earlier. And this is our God, my friends. This is in the God in whose name we gather, and Jesus, our master, he gives us this ultimate example of what to strive for. All right, but, but knowing these things and living like they're true are different, right? I like the words believing these things <laughs> is different than behaving like they're true. And that's where we can kind of get stuck sometimes. There's this fascinating I, I saying that I've found, and there's varying um, sources it's attributed to. But the saying is simply this, the longest journey you will ever take is the 18 inches from your head to your heart. You ever heard that one before? 
The longest journey you'll take is the 18 inches right here <laughs> from your head to your heart. Because knowing things and then believing them or like having knowledge but then putting it into practice, that's sometimes a really difficult journey. To convert knowledge into action. And sometimes it's especially difficult in relation to today's topic. Because we're talking about the global heart of God. Like we just sang songs about it uh, that kind of are aimed at that and hearing about it. And we talk about missions but the idea of a global heart of God is, is something easier to, to know and a little more difficult to live into. And some of you have maybe heard the passage that we're going to camp out in today a bunch of times. A lot of you have probably done more study than I have on it. Maybe some of you are brand new to this passage. That's awesome. Either way, instead of unpacking all of the specifics, we'll look at some for sure. But instead of un unpacking everything, my hope today is that we glean enough from this scripture to, to have in our minds, but then we force this migration down. We press it down and we say, God, would you press this, these difficult 18 inches from my mind to my heart and move me to something? Would my heart look like yours and would my life look like yours as a result? So that's the hope. Um, <clears throat> I can't do that for you. We can't sometimes even do that on our own. So let's ask God to help us in that endeavor, okay? Let me pray. Father, thank you for this day, and uh, God, thank you for warming our hearts as our bodies are warming too, God. But uh, we just believe that you give us life, and it came through your death and resurrection. And I just pray as we just step further into what that good news means for us, God, would it just be a natural thing to flow out of what, how can that good news come to many more? Uh, on this earth, whether they're close by or literally on the other side of the globe. God, so I just pray as we look to your word, would you be the one that unlocks things in us? Would you be the one that gives us courage and confidence to step into it? God, not anything I do or say, uh, but may it all be about you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. All right, we'll go to the probably familiar passage, but Matthew 28, it's the last chapter in the book of Matthew, right before the book of Mark. Uh, on page 835 of your pew Bible if you need it, 835. It is the last paragraph of the book of Matthew. Starting in verse 16, it says this, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, that's Jesus, when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted, verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. I'm with you to the end of the age. So let me just give you a super fast biblical context, a little flyover of what preceded these words of Jesus, okay? So this is after Jesus' formal ministry. He spent three years with his disciples teaching and training and, and showing and healing and all these things. This is after that. It's after he shares this last meal with his followers, his closest inner few in the upper room. It's after he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane to say, God, I don't love what's about to happen. So if there's other ways to do it, would you do that? It's after, though, he's arrested and after he's beaten and after he's falsely convicted, he's marched up a hill. It's after he's nailed to a cross, dies, and is buried in a borrowed tomb, and it's right after he rose from the dead. So it's right after he rose. The, the tomb is empty. A couple people have seen him, and that's where we pick up the story. Like a couple people that have seen him are some of the women. Remember the story uh, we talk about at Easter time? He's, Jesus is buried, but because of the Sabbath, the women can't go back to anoint the body with spices until after the Sabbath. So they come to do this to this dead body, but Jesus is not there. He's not dead, and they're confused and upset, and whom they think is the gardener says, who are you looking for? And it's Jesus himself, right? So he appears to them and he says, go tell the others and let's uh, have them meet me in Galilee. So this is all happening, uh, but word is starting to get out. Uh-oh, the guy that uh, was killed is no longer in the grave. So the religious elite that had put Jesus to death, 
they start paying off the guards and say, hey, anybody asks, we don't really know what happened, but if anybody asks, tell them Jesus' disciples took his body. So all of this has happened, but to the, the core that have followed Jesus for a few years, they haven't seen him yet until this moment. <laughs> so they go to Galilee and they see Jesus. And we're not going to spend a lot of time in verses 16 and 17. So let me just really quick pull out a few just quick observations, okay? They're in your notes. I'm going to go fast, but there it is. So number one is they obediently showed up. So these disciples, they've heard the testimony of the women that they've known from following Jesus, and they just obediently show up in Galilee. It's like, I don't know, is this a trap? Is this a trick? Is this real life? Like, is Jesus actually going to be there? I'm sure there was trepidation and fear, but they obediently showed up. And the lesson we can learn is even when things don't make sense, man, we, we've got to obediently show up when Jesus calls. Number two, they saw Jesus. I love that it makes this distinction. And when they, um, and when they saw him, so it's not just like, and then they worshiped him. They saw him. Because here's what I know to be true. You can go to the right place at the right time, and you can choose what you see. So they could have obediently showed up, but unless they would have consciously looked at Jesus and seen him and, and, and sought him, they would have missed him. So for you and I, like, our eyes must want to see God. Like, they must want to seek him, and as we seek him, the Bible says we'll find him. It's a great promise. Number three, they worshiped him. So their response to this mighty king who had just risen from the dead in power and magnificence was this devotion-filled worship and praise, and that should be our response to God too. Number four, I know this is fast, but these are just initial things. <laughs> Number four, some doubted. I love this. This gives me hope. Here are these people that knew Jesus on earth more than you and I ever will right now. They walked with him. They saw how he, he encountered people, how he ministered, what his relationship with the Father, and being told that he's raised from the dead and that he wants to meet with them and talk with them, they, some of them doubted. And that gives me hope that I don't have to always have it all figured out either. And last but not least, they listened to his words. So the text doesn't actually say this, uh, but I get I have the hunch that when they finally see this risen Lord Jesus, after seeing him go to the grave, and the like risen from the dead God man starts talking, my hunch is they're like, ooh, we should shut up and listen. <laughs> we should like be quiet and see what he's got to say. So they lean in. And that's just a quick kind of uh, dissection of the posture they find themselves before Jesus' words as a means to say this, in the same manner, my friends, as we dive into this passage, let's obediently show up. Like, let's trust that the Lord wants to guide us and lead us here for a reason. And you and I, let's show up. And let's see Jesus, not just kind of be in the same space with him, but let's see him and worship him. Even if we have doubts, let's try to hear what he wants to say. Let's lean in <laughs> to his words. I think this past week, what the Lord has kind of guided me to lean into is a series of five statements that he says that all revolve around the word all, A-L-L. -L. Five times he mentions this. So let's look again. Uh, we're going to start this time in the middle of verse 18. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So maybe you're starting to catch them already and see where we're going, these, these all statements. But we're going to dive in and see what Jesus said to his followers then, what I think he still wants to say to his followers today. Uh, and then just listen in hopes that our hearts look a little bit more like the heart of Jesus and that our actions follow as a result. So first up, these are all in your notes, but number one is Jesus has all authority. Okay? Jesus has all authority. 
says he has all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to him. And this is an important concept, but also kind of one that's hard to wrap our finite minds around, right? So there's this, uh, this tenet we have that, God is, or that Jesus is fully God and fully man, right? It's got a super cool, fancy name called the hypostatic union. And that is, sounds cool, and it's like a huge mystery, right? It's like, well, if God's fully man, fully God, like how much authority or power exactly did he have on earth? Or like, where was the line exactly of where Jesus submitted to the Father? Or, or what things could he do or not do? We could pontificate on that uh, for a long time, and that would be fun. But <laughs> suffice it to say, I think this idea is just too complex to fully understand. We understand it enough to say, wow, that is who Jesus is. But it's kind of riddled throughout Scripture, this idea, especially in the Gospels. The word authority, many of which relate to Jesus and his authority versus the Father's, uh, are mentioned 48 times within 43 verses of just the Gospels. But here in Matthew 28, we sort of see this change because Jesus now isn't uh, in his earthly form that he came to earth in. He's in this resurrected form. And the difference, this distinct change is that Jesus now possesses all authority in heaven and earth, right? So there's this change. All authority is given to him. So Jesus, in essence, we could say he can command anyone to do anything and the weight of his words will carry unchallenged because he now has all authority to do that. But what do we see him do? <laughs> we see him invite you and me on a mission. Like anything he could speak and anything he could make happen. And what he says is, hey, let's go. Let's go on this mission. Come in on this mission, this co-mission that I have to seek and save the lost. Look again, verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So you can fill in blank number two, this one, is Jesus calls all to make disciples. Jesus calls all to make disciples. Now, I know all of us being called to make disciples is a little intimidating, uh, and I realize it's not directly in the text, right? This one doesn't have the actual word all in it. So let me just break it down a little bit, maybe ease some of the, I don't know, kind of hole poking that might be happening. Because some of you could be saying, hold on, Jeff, I've done my research. <laughs> I've looked at this passage, I've sought the Lord on it, and we can't all move to the other side of the globe, Jeff. Like, not everyone is called to go in that capacity, and I would say, friend, you're totally right. I absolutely agree with that statement. And I also believe that sometimes we might overemphasize the wrong part of the message. Because here's what, I grew up in church and went to conferences and things like this. And I've heard a lot of messages that center on the going. On the going of the go and make disciples. And that's not all bad. It's not inherently wrong. But but may I suggest it can easily warp this calling and this mandate that I think Christ gives to all of us. It can warp that into this like, this really niche thing that only super Christians or something like that can go and do and have this distinct calling to go to this unreached people group on the other side of the world. And that's amazing, but that's not all it is. So let me just say for the record, <laughs> supporting global missions is good. And as we do that as a body, as we financially support that, even if we're not the ones being sent to the other side of the world, that is a good thing. But I think it's less about going and more about making disciples. And this could be a whole series of messages in itself. But you could say it this way, like all are called to go and make disciples. It's just a matter of destination. Right? Like we're all called to go, and by going, meaning making disciples, <laughs> but with different destinations. Because as we do the church, not just you or not just the select group of people, but the church steps into her calling <laughs> a little bit more. Because sometimes as we go and make disciples, those disciples are made on the other side of the planet in a group in a village that has never, ever heard about Jesus. And we praise God for that. 
But sometimes we go and we're sent to make disciples, and it's in the people down our street that need to see and hear and be demonstrated that Christians are not what they think they are. And sometimes we're go, we're, or we're sent and we go to make disciples and they're made within the four walls of our family's home. We're all going and making disciples. It's just a different destination. So can I ask you, where are you going today? Whom are you discipling? If this is a thing, but it might not have to happen on the other side of the planet, though it could... Uh, who are you discipling? Where are you going? How are you responding to the call that Jesus gives you? You know, in the bulletin, there's, there's a line in there. God may be asking me to go or disciple someone here. And maybe there's already something stirring in your mind or your heart that you know, I think it might be that person at work, or I think it might be that person. Just to give you some examples, maybe it's a newer believer Maybe in this very room, maybe you're sitting uh, next to people week in and week out, and you just have this nudge, I should talk to them. I should just like invest in them. I should see if they want to grab coffee, and God's given me a testimony and a journey to share with others, and maybe that's your going. Maybe that's your making disciples. Maybe it's someone at your job or down the street that, that seems to be open to having spiritual conversations. Like, while this can be scary, I've actually encountered that nowadays, and maybe out here, uh, perhaps it's a difference regionally, uh, part of the country, but I think many are open to spiritual conversations. Maybe not Christian conversations yet, but spiritual conversations. Could it be that, that the going or the discipling does involve that, that people group that have never heard that Jesus is Lord and he died and he rose again for them? Or maybe there are family members in your extended family that that honestly, you've kind of been withholding, helping them move forward in their faith because you just don't totally align on all the issues. Whatever it looks like, let's get going, church, <laughs> and making disciples. But it's going to be hard to jump into that and just do that, whether that's near or in our houses or on the other side of the world. It's going to be a tough step to take if our heart doesn't look like Christ. So let's get to know that. And that's number three. Jesus has a heart for all nations. Jesus has a heart for all nations. Now, I think one of the gifts that we have, you and I, in where we're positioned in history and culturally is this thing right here. Did you know not everyone has access to a Bible? <laughs> not in their language, at the readily accessibility that we do, but we see and we experience what we believe is the living, active Word of God, and in it, in these 66 small little books, it's telling one big story. And our hero, the triune God of the universe, man, he's consistent all the way through. Like different facets we see in different movements, but one of the themes we see is that God has a heart for all people. God has a heart for all nations and all creation and all the earth. And at risk of sounding like LeVar from <laughs> Reading Rainbow, you don't have to take my word for it. I love that show. That's fun. So here's what we're going to do. In like two minutes, maybe not even, I want to just go through five short little examples from Genesis to Revelation just to illustrate the times that this language comes up, that God is the God of all, or God is a God uh, that has a heart for all people and all nations and tribes and tongues. So check us out. Genesis 28, 14. The references are in your notes too, so don't feel like you gotta scribble them down. Genesis 28, 14. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will be spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Fast forward, Psalm 117, verse one. Praise the Lord, all you nations, Extol him, all you peoples. This is a call to worship, all peoples, to worship the one true God. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, he said to them, this is Jesus' words, the same account of what we're looking at just in Mark's gospel. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to who? All creation. 
Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The word here is that like this movement starts and expands and grows and swells and soon all of the earth. And then last but not least, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, this is a picture of heaven, and I looked And there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation and tribe and people and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. Friends, if there's one thing that I, more than anything else I say today that I hope you walk away with, is that God has a heart for all people. God has a heart for all nations, whether we do or not whether we have direct experience with those nations or not, whether we uh, like certain people in our sphere of influence or not, God has a heart for them, all of them. He wants to seek and save all who are lost. And our call is to help or to let him shape our hearts in more of the same way. And it's not just going to happen. I wish there was like a a follow-up step would be a grab that card or use that QR code, and then tomorrow it's just going to be the case. Uh, your heart looks exactly like God's. But I do think he gives us seasons to grow in that, and he gives us steps to grow in that. And there might be baby steps to start now. There might be bigger leaps in your story. There'll probably be setbacks and flops and failures. But growing forward <laughs> in our heart for the world only puts us more in step with the Spirit, and more aligned with the global heart of God. I remember growing up, years is years ago, maybe like 15 years ago now, one of the steps that I just felt nudged to take in like growing my heart for the world was at a concert. You know, when you go to those uh, like Christian concerts, sometimes other concerts too, and there's a break before the band, and it's like, okay, we've got our friends from child sponsorship thing here to talk about, you know, it's a coffee a week, people but in that moment, it was this honest, like, wow, I, I only really care about my bubble. So I raised my hand, and uh, one boy has been graduated now, but uh, month in and month out, 30-whatever dollars uh, goes to Yoker League in Haiti. And it was a, a, a movement, one step back then, <laughs> that I took to grow my heart. But truth be told, there's plenty of months over the years plenty of years over the years, <laughs> where that money just changes hand. It just comes out of my account, and I don't even really realize it, and there's not this active movement into sharing the heart that God has for the world. Because during that same season, I don't know, eight, ten years ago now, it's like we're living in Minneapolis, and even though I'm stepping in in one hand, I'm kind of like, I don't know about those people at the playground, I don't know what I have in common. I don't know how to strike up a conversation. Like, kid, maybe let's go play over here. My son, not other people, weird. Um, right? But it was like, ooh, I- I'm, I'm living into it in part. But I've got a lot of growth for my heart to look like the heart God has for other people. And I don't know what your story looks like or what steps you've taken or what ones you may need to take, but I do do you believe that God desires our hearts to look more like his? And so there might be something that's just in your heart, in your mind right now. Maybe, it's, maybe it is uh, exploring a child sponsorship program to say, you know what? I can totally do that. I can do a $39 thing a month, and if that's what God's percolating in you, well, you're in luck. One week from today, African New Life Ministries will be here. And you can go meet quite literally through a picture and a name, somebody on the other side of the world in Rwanda that you can start to grow your heart towards and expand what you know and feel and love about the heart that God has. Like maybe for you, there's was that season in college or earlier in your life where, where you were just like really hearing from the Lord and he, he kind of called you to a certain type of a people group or, or a, a type of person here locally, and that's just kind of gone dormant. And it's been stuffed down because, well, life's busy and there's other things to do. Maybe your step into having your heart look more like the Lord's heart for all nations is to 
pull that out and kind of dust the <laughs> cobwebs off and to say, Lord, do you still want to do that thing with me for those people? Maybe your step is inviting the new neighbor that moved in, right? That, that you just know, wow, we're in a different spot uh, in life and in faith and socioeconomically and culturally. Dare I say it? You might be in a different spot politically than the person. Uh, no matter what, what would it look like for you to take a step and to say, I want your heart for all people, God. I'm going to invite that neighbor over and we're going to share a meal around my table and I want to get to know their life. And I want to get to know like what, what's been beautiful in their life and what's been really difficult and be able to share some of mine. <laughs> or maybe uh, as the months have come, come and gone here, you hear about mission trips that we're taking and you're like, I should sign up. I should talk to Dina. <laughs> I should go to the table. And you miss the deadline. It's like, dang, maybe today's the day. Go chat with Dina or go to the missions table for any of these things just to explore what step God might have you take. And maybe one that's a little different, but I think it's the same theme. <laughs> maybe a step for you is as simple and difficult, but as simple as lingering in the lower lobby and having conversations with people that you might actually think are more different than you, <laughs> than people on the other side of the world. And saying, God, I believe your heart is for all people, and would you make mine be the same. Friends, a heart like God's for all people, it's not a burden, it's a gift. <laughs> so let's let him clarify the step he's got. And then like the disciples did that we saw, let's show up and let's see Jesus and let's listen to his words. All right, number four, Jesus calls us to teach all he has commanded, to teach all he has commanded. I believe one of the roadblocks to seeing more people like know and follow Jesus is our lack of obedience to follow all that Jesus has commanded. And that might sound harsh and I don't intend it to, but, but I, I honestly believe it, that sometimes the roadblock to more people knowing and following and loving Jesus is the fact that they see our lack of obedience, to actually follow and be changed by what he says. Like, I probably don't need to convince you it's hard to teach somebody something <laughs> that you don't know yourself, right? But being faith and following Jesus is more than this head knowledge. It's a heart posture. It's maybe all the more true. Because we do need to know things in our minds, again, those beliefs. But we also need to be trying to work them into our lives. And as we do, as we know and experience and live out those beliefs and behaviors, man, that's when I think the gospel takes root in people and can expand. If we don't believe it, how are others going to believe it as a result of us? And my wife and I, for the last few years, we've been trying to take more seriously uh, like the, the kind of living that Christ embodied when he was on earth and, uh, and just emulate it. Like, we think we're his students, so we should do what he's doing and what he did and, and try to talk like he talked and things like that. And, and it's been a real joy and a serious challenge to lean into that and say, okay, I believe that that's who you are, God, and I want to behave like it's true. And bit by bit, we're following in his footsteps and, and seeing these things be worked into our lives. And, and even slower than that, honestly, is the ability for others to to work them into theirs. But it's been really beautiful to watch. Not because we do these things to be right with God, but because we're in relationship with him. And it's rich and growing that we see them kind of take root. So, all right, we have one more section. I'm not going to give it to you right now, number five. Because before we do, I want to pause. And I want to uh, watch just a quick video of our, some of our team that returned from Wales recently. So last week, they uh, came back, or a couple weeks ago, they came back from a time in Wales supporting and learning from our global partners there. And they were led to just really amazing things, some scarier things, <laughs> uh, but in their heart to say, God, I want to have a heart like yours for the world, and I want to see the world how you see it and show up and tell the world about Jesus. Uh, that's what they did. So just a little snapshot. Take a look at this, and then we'll come back up close. 
Well, first of all, I should probably say the couple uh, who are the missionaries in Wales are Ryan and Angela McCullough. They uh, invited this team of us from True Hope to come and work with them in the country. Wales is a country that needs um, a lot of help. It's a dark country spiritually. There's a lot of satanic worship, a lot of new age um, philosophies, and the churches are struggling. And so Ryan and Angela have this ministry where they are helping to revive churches. This couple was having ministry not only with churches that were of the Pentecostal stripe that is who they are, but they had they had relationships with the vicar of the Anglican church in that area, a 30-something-year-old guy named Mark Broadway, and they knew his ministry. We went and visited them and him. We laid hands on him, which was probably the first time that had ever happened in his life. But this, this Anglican, really loves the Lord and is just uh, fired up the people. <laughs> and, and then you think, there's Baptists and Anglicans and Pentecostals. And then the last night we went and visited the Baptist church there just because it was across the street from our hotel. And they were having Sunday night services at the Baptist church. So three of us guys went over and sat through that thing. And at the end... They offered us the microphone and said, come up, come up, tell us what you're doing here. And so we shared with the Baptists what we were doing with the Pentecostals. And it was just was such a neat experience that way. It's about the people. Well, we were doing some street witnessing and sharing in one of the towns. And a young lady with her son came walking down and my wife handed her one of the pamphlets, and her name was Allison. And in the course of asking her if she attended a church and stuff, she indicated that she did when she was a little girl, but had not been back to church in years, and had no desire to go back to church. So as we got into the conversation with Allison, the Spirit just led us to ask the question, who in the church hurt you? And she broke down crying and weeping. And I sensed that she was hurt deeply, extremely deeply in her walk with Christ at some point by Christians and therefore stopped going to church. Well, while she was weeping, we prayed for her. She allowed us to pray for her and her son and just shared the gospel with her and told her of the opportunity she had in the community she was living. Then Gail, the pastor of the church there that we were working with, came walking up and they made a connection. And the young lady lives very close to the church. So Gail was going to continue to do some follow-up with her and she was open to that. So she went from not wanting anything to do with church to opening up and breaking down on the street to opening her heart and considering to going back. The hardest part for me going into it was we got a, a schedule before we left, and on one of the days it was street evangelism. And I was like, oh, I don't, I don't know about that. <laughs> and I was really quite nervous. We just started, well, the first place we went was a little mom and pop grocery store, a little market, and um, just started talking with them actually about the cabbage they were selling nothing I'd ever seen before, and they were just explaining about their um, their market, how it started, and they aren't believers, they've never, they don't go to church, but they were very open to talk about why and about their lives. It was very easy. And we, then we went on and talked to many other people. Um, one man that we spoke with um, was uh, talking to us and very open and then he went away and did some shopping came back and he flagged Rick down He wanted to finish talking about uh, what he talked about before 
And so it was all very uh, not scary. I was very, I was really pleased that it was something that isn't out of the realm of possibility for me. Isn't that cool? Isn't that inspiring? Encouraging to see a group of people right here. You probably know most of them. They're saying, Lord, I want a heart like yours. I want to see people and encounter people like you would. By the way, there's so many more minutes, hours maybe, (laughs) of footage that we captured. And in this coming week, uh, we want you to be able to have the opportunity, if you want to, to hear more of the expanded story. So look for that in uh, the next few days. But but I love watching and hearing how others are growing their hearts more like Jesus. But here's the temptation. I can watch those things and I can see, I, I can kind of bring that to myself to say, man, I should be doing that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to make a plan and I'm going to do that. But it's not just me in my own strength that does that, is it? So the last all statement that Jesus says, is found in verse 20, and it says, and behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. My friends, all that claims earlier, that still stands, but if we miss this last thing, I think we miss the whole point, that Jesus is with us all the days. It's number five, Jesus is with us all the days. And I realize that it's not the word always, that might mess with your brain, it's fine, because you can actually translate always as all the days. And why I picked that phrase is kind of near and dear to my heart. Uh, My oldest, Reese, who's now like eight, when he was like three or four, I don't remember even what was happening, but he was, you could tell he just wanted to bless his mama with like the sweetest little word. And so he racks his brain for all these little words and language he's been hearing and, and sponging up, and he looks at my wife and he says, Mama, I love you all the days of much. (laughs) Isn't that cute? I love you all the days of much, Mama. Everything in his heart, he offered that to us. But here's the deal. I don't think the tone of Jesus' words are probably much different to you and I. I think he looks upon his kids and he says, I know what I'm asking you is difficult. I know it's going to stretch you out of your comfort zone. I know it's not going to be easy. I know you're going to have to give things up. I know you're going to have questions. I know it's going to push you and stretch you, but I love you all the days of much, (laughs) and I'll be with you every day and always, and it's not your strength, it's mine. So I'm with you when you're crushing it, and I'm with you when you fail miserably. Like, I'm with you when you're energized by this global call, and I'm, wish you, and I'm with you when it's overwhelming and you wish it didn't exist. Like, I'm with you when things are happening in my name and the kingdom's moving, and I'm with you during those inevitable seasons of drought. I'm with you, Jesus says. And friends, it's true, he's with us. We don't do it alone. In fact, we don't do it at all. He is with us to the very end of the age. And maybe you've heard this verse before, but real quick, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, it says, I, this is Paul's words, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. He goes on to say, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. I love that. The power to grow and to change and to save is not ours. It's God's. Don't take it back. Of course, we should be faithful to sow the seeds that God puts in our hand. And of course, we should ask the Holy Spirit to discern kind of what we should water to make grow. But it's only God who gives the growth. And he's with us and he's never left for today and tomorrow and for all the days of much. (laughs) He gives us hope and power and life and joy and salvation both once and for all and then ongoing for the rest of our natural lives. And to remember how this came to be, the church is given the ordinance of communion. The Lord's Supper, maybe even the Eucharist, you may have heard it called. But God gives us this to remember. See, we believe that Jesus was dead but came back to life, and as we trust 
and acknowledge him as Lord of our life, we too follow in that same pattern. We were dead in our sins and without God, but because of Jesus in his life and death and resurrection, we share in new life. And even though Jesus isn't physically present right now, we still continue in his footsteps, in the footsteps of his disciples. We believe in him, and we remember him, and then we tell the world about him. And so that's kind of the flavor that communion is going to have today. And it's going to look a little bit different. I'm just going to warn you right now, but you can do this. Because what we're going to practice is remembering Jesus through communion, but also telling about Jesus. So that by practicing with each other, maybe just in a little tiny way, we're more fit to go tell the world about him. Okay? So here's how it's going to look. Whenever you're ready, the band's going to come. They're going to play a song. Um, You don't have to sing along. You don't need to sing along. They're going to play a song, and then there's going to be more music after that. Whenever you're ready, after praying or searching your heart with the Lord, come on down the center aisles. You'll peel off to either side. There's tables. You can't see these, but I'll just show you. Whatever. Uh, There's this uh, basket of bread, various breads to kind of represent that God is a global God, representative of the body of Christ, and then the little communion cups that we have like normal. So you go through the line, you'll grab the bread, grab the cup, and you'll hear words like this. This is the body and blood of Jesus for you. Remember him and go tell the world. And you'll take and eat and you'll drink your cup But then don't peel off quite yet, because the person next or behind you, when they come up to the table, you'll share those words. You'll say something to the effect of, hey, this is Jesus' body and blood for you. Remember him and then go tell the world, okay? So you go through, you'll get the bread. There'll be people to help you if you get stuck. It's on the bottom of your (laughs) bulletin if you need help, right? But we, we remember and we tell and we share the hope of Jesus. So I'm going to pray, and then whenever you're ready, come down, receive the elements, and then you're free to go. Like, you can just go out to your car, you can go back to your seat, whatever you want to do, um, but just be mindful, there might be people still praying and still experiencing this time, okay? I'm going to pray, the band's going to come, and then uh, we'll partake in communion together. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for these words that are not our words, <laughs> God, but they are yours, and I just thank you, or just uh, ask that in the same spirit of your followers so many years ago, would we see you? Would we listen and lean in? And would we have the courage to do what you ask us to do? Not just bolster our beliefs in our minds, but would it migrate down to our hearts and inform our actions and our lives and everything about us, God? So I just pray as we remember what you have done for us, would that give us uh, boldness and hope to proclaim who you are to a world that needs to hear. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, whenever you're ready, feel free to come down.